Alex Bush observed something awesome about Tyrix that I'm really glad people are picking up on. I love how fatherhood has been such a constant theme throughout Tyrix's story. From his genetic father, he learned how to make difficult decisions and trust his instincts to do what is right, even if it might go against direct orders and allegiance to his legion. From his father figure, Forgal, who spent a hundred or so years fighting the dragons and eventually gave his life in a final stand against them, Tyrix learns what means to truly devote yourself to a cause greater than yourself. Both fatherly lessons taken together, Tyrix has developed a sense of mor morality and duty. There's more like fatherhoody stuff that seems to snuck in through this route through the story as well. And I love how Guild Wars 2 just lets that kind of stuff organically grow. Fight with valor. Ugh, still seasick. At least we made it in one piece. Traherne's waiting up on deck. It'll pass. Did you bring the vacuum magical polarizer? I did. Once the battle is underway, find me and I'll give you one. Is this what I think it is? How do they compress all those angles? Well, I'm still just plug it in. I'm on my way, preset. <laughs> all right, I'm sure you are. Okay, so with Professor Gore at our side as the oncoming Risen Hordes come at us, uh, once the fight's underway, we can speak with him. I'm oh, sorry, this is Dern. He says, I hope the Priory and... Oh my God, they're blowing up and really hurting us. Jesus Christ, be very careful here. Uh, we're putting a lot of lives on the line. I'm well aware we are, but I wasn't trying to speak to you, Dern. Where is Gore? Gore says, I'm gaining a newfound respect for my remote teams. This is horrible, and it's not even ore. Brilliant. So, we have a charisma response here. Keep your brain working and you'll be fine. Just as barbarism appears for other uh, NPC allies, this time we get to be captivating, which was one of the personality subtitles. Keep your brain working, you'll be fine, Gore. You're a kind, Brecht. Thank you. I'll try to stay safe. Yeah, be brave, dude. The other thing we can say to him is, I need a vacuum magic polarizer. So, when we click this... Uh, we do actually get the polarizer, which we were testing in his lab back in Ratasum. Our skill bar changes. This is not deployable or like a turret or anything. We actually get to fire and use this. And this is basically the be-all and end-all of having Gore with you. You'll notice his unique modifier is not fury, it's protection that he permanently applies to himself. On top of other regular protection we could give him as well beyond that. But yeah, so we get the uh, vacuum magic sucker so we can run over. Use the skill 2 to start charging it. And as you can see, we're unlocking the skill 3 down there. The uh, ridiculous blast. Debuffing this guy as we do it. He's polarized. And we can use this at any point through this regular mission. Utterly nuking various creatures that come our way. Here's the panel. I have to reverse it, resource cell the amplification, and attach the capacitor. Just keep them off me. So this time you will notice as we uh, assault these crates, the war machine in the area is just a regular treb slash catapult here. Oh my god, the huge explosions are great. It's a shame we had weakness on us there because that denied us a ton of damage, but we still wiped those crates out instantly. This thing's amazing. Uh, basically, the gun is the be-all and end-all here. The vacuum magic sucker, it basically unlocks another way to play the mission in terms of your profession skills the whole way through. There's no, like phase one stuff and then another you know professor gore's assistant here that does something different instead this time it will be three catapults which means taking the courtyard you won't get the assistance and the final fight might play a little bit differently so yeah there really are pretty substantial changes based on what ally you run with prepare yourselves troops wait for the dragon to come around then make a coordinated strike on my order wait for it So here we can use the vacuum magic to suck power from the multiple grubs that spawn. And they're like a benefit that you might completely ignore on a different run through.
The master would be proud, Lightbringer. You've truly earned that title today. Hello. Tibble would be proud. Oh my goodness! That was terrifying! Petrifying! Exhilarating! We mean? owe a portion of our victory to you and There's your weapon, Professor. You did pretty good there, dude. I'm pretty happy with that. Can I keep it forever, well please? Especially since I've got my anti-anti-arcanic arrow ready right now with a massive overloaded crazy time wallop. Let Orr hear the echo of this battle. We can defeat the dragons. We will. There is a ruined fortress at the edge of Orr, south of the Shattercleft Hills. From that high cliff, you can see the spires of ore rising beyond the Straits of Devastation. We will take this fort and make it our own. The Pact will rebuild it. We will place our banners, and from there we will strike at the dragon's heart. All right, and with Retribution complete, we level up. That's a big level two, guys. It's very good as well because as we move into Act 3, the story is now level 70. We need to hit the big 7-0 to be able to progress. And with the conclusion of that, Bract just hit level 70. Personal story, chapter 7 is now available. So let's jump on in. First, I think it's time for a gear upgrade. In the depths, surrounded by the very foundations of Tyria, a battle was raging. Impact rocked the narrow passage, sending showers of earth and pebbles scattering along the uneven floor. Screeching, high-pitched sound filled the corridor, shaking more dust loose with every bone-jarring pulse and waver. Flattening his ears close to his neck, Delix dashed through the wreckage with his decrystalline etherizer close at hand. I know you're coming in, Delix, a voice shouted from up ahead, barely rising over the din. I'm a sonographic engineer. Did you think I wouldn't hear you? Ha! Delix saw the wave approaching before it hit him, a wobbly looking motion in the air that signalled the solid wash of sound. He dove behind a boulder, but the assault struck him even as he leapt for cover. With a waft of terrible howling, whining cacophony, the sound wave spun him end over end until he slammed against the caravan wall. Oof! He grunted, but the noise of his protest was lost amid the din. See that, the voice shouted again. Nothing's getting through my sonopath. path. Whoever holds it is immune to it, and Skrit have delicate ears. You hear me? Delicate. Flix rolled out into the hallway, etherizer pointed, focused, and ready. The ball of crystal at its end flared with a strange pinkish gleam, and then a light shot toward the end of the hallway. Ew, is <sighs> The voice faded. And then there was the thud of an unconscious body hitting the stone floor. Seizing his opportunity, Delix shoved the etherizer into his belt and raced forward. Leaping over barriers made of stone, debris, and broken furniture, he landed solidly over an unconscious Asura woman, still twitching a bit from the effects of the etherizer ray. Hanging on her back, above her was a half-cocked sonic generator, modified from bits and pieces of original dredge rig. If I hadn't had earplugs, that would have killed me. Not bad, Poisy. Blix reached up and pulled the torque abjura from the sonic generator, deactivating the device. He paused to breathe on the copper-coloured abjura and polished it against his sleeve as the machine wound down. Once the noise faded, he popped the earplugs out of his ears and smiled. But not good enough. He snapped the abjura in half and peered inside curiously. No. Poise managed, her voice wavery with the after-effects of his etherizer. My sonopath will get me out of here. I don't want to die. I'm not taking your gadget. Delix pushed the abjure into Poise's pocket. I came to get something else. Carefully, Delix reached down and removed her left shoe. With cautious hands, he tucked it away into his knapsack, pausing to stare at her. He bent down a second time and also took the long scarf Poise wore around her neck. This too, I think. Delix muttered. Why can you leave me alone? Poise moaned, her eyes rolling in half-conscious annoyance. Just go away! Delix stood, drawing his coat close around his body. You're a member of my crew, Poise, he snarled. Did you expect me to forget that? With a dismissive snort, he turned, drew his decrystalline etherizer into his hand once more, and vanished away into the dark passages of the earth. Interesting. Hmm. 
The submerged section is truly a marvel, isn't it? Indeed. The view is nearly ruined, however, by the undead scratching at the glass. I'm not sure the liquefaction weapon is functioning properly. Does it cause test subjects to dissolve and disperse into solution? Yes, but it's not killing them. What's left in the vats is... disturbing. Boil off the excess liquid and start again. We need results we can use. We are back! Welcome on Bracked Chilling, uh, ready for some more adventures in this tent, ruminating, reminiscing on all the wonderful things we accomplished, recapturing Claw Island and the creation of this new organization, a conglomeration, a c combining of the three orders into the pact. So, uh, yes, we have a letter from Trahan, and he says this, regarding a critical mission, my friend, it is time to begin the Pact's unified effort against Zaitan. Our future headquarters is already under construction, but I need your input on another important matter. I have called in representatives from all three orders to present my initial proposals on the Pact's command structure, logistics, combat strategies, and other vital issues. I need you there. Please, join me in Concordia as soon as you can. So, yeah, uh, as Trahan explained, we are going to be his second-hand man in all matter of different things, and we're going to help him out with this straight away. Uh, so we're going to find Trahan at a camp, that camp being quite far away, actually, down to the south uh, on the border of the mountains. The trek south into higher level, more dangerous territory is very real now. The game, now that we're in the final act, is going to rapidly move us south into the dead lands below. Uh, so that is one of the main things we're going to be doing here today. I'm chilling out just outside my order's uh, entrance to its headquarters here at Dead End Cave. I wonder, with the creation of the pact, whether that means Order of Whispers have to give up some of its secrets, like where they're based out of and stuff. It's kind of a curious thought that they'd want to be close to the chest on that. And maybe that's exactly the kind of difficult logistics that Traherne has to work out in the background. Uh, but yeah, so we've changed the way our gear looks a little. Largely stat-wise, rune-wise, all of that is pretty much the same as the extremely dangerous dangerous, devastating stuff we set up for Cordicus's manor. Uh, but yeah, I uh, put us into more Asuran cultural armor here. So this is what the Asura uh, tend to look like. In fact, you might notice a lot of inquests dressed like this, but it's dyed. And you've got to bear with me, guys. I'm not very good at the fashion wars sides of this game, right? But it's dyed to look a little bit darker. It's less bright, less vibrant. It's not meant to look inquest necessarily, but it's meant to look like we have drawn from our experiences in the Order of Whispers. And we're just trying to be a little bit more shady, a little bit more close to the chest with things. We've also got a nice backpack on now. Once again, one of the crafting backpacks I've recently described to you guys. And on this bright sunny day, we're going to start heading south of Blood Tide Coast. An area of the world that Brax never actually been to before. So if we uh, press M and go to our large map here... Brack's adventures have been quite close guarded, right? We've been to Ratasoon, we've explored a lot of the Tarnished Coast, we travelled up through Kryter and done various things with Kryter politics. We've never actually been further east than that. We've never been to the mountains, we've never been to Ascalon, we've never been particularly far north. I mean, we haven't been, and we've never been particularly far south either. So, uh, yeah, this is all pretty much uncharted territory. Uh, that he's going to have to wade through to get all the way over to Concordia. Uh, I did also want to show off and just recap a little bit what our story general's been saying. Because I found it kind of cool at this point. We've been gathering quite a few nice items. Uh, at the start of the game, we recovered our prospectus. This is the original proposal for the variable atmospheric condition weather changing device. Uh, which is what we'd invented. Uh, later on, we got this Order of Whispers emblem. This swatch of gold-knotted scarlet cloth denotes the carrier as a member of the Order of Whispers. I love the thought of us slinging that over our shoulders as we travel. And we've got some pirate boots from when we dressed up as a pirate. Later, uh, we got Ichnu's spear. Ichnu carried his brother's head on this spear. It's been cleaned. Uh, so a nice little recap of the story so far there. And then just now we acquired a oh, lion's arch I'd banner. I'd love to swim across mournful depths. Nice going, Buka. <laughs> this is great. We're in a very cool event right now. Worm love it everywhere. That really brightens the place up. Uh, these are Sura are doing an experiment and an investigation based on stuff that really technically happens later in the timeline. So we're not going to focus too much on this. This is another one of the mega meta events. You notice that that's a champion lava there and there's a ton of players. This is like the Shatterer event, except way harder 
And we're actually in a lot of danger by being around here. These massive pods could blow us up. Let's just keep going south. It's kind of cool that we see this, though, as we travel through. Um, yeah, and here we just got this Lion's Arch banner. A banner recovered from Claw Island after its recapture from Zaitan's forces. For me. I definitely like the thought that it's been a while now since that occurrence. And, uh, you know, we've, we've relaxed a bit. Traherne's figured out lots of different things. And movement has begun. You'll be familiar with the idea of the Lion's Road already. Look at all of these worm spores. This is scary. Uh, this is all related to the event going on back there. Uh, that these guys are going to have to wade through. You remember the Lion's Road and all the Lion's Havens and things. Well, now that the Pact has been established, all throughout uh, Tyria, they're going to start establishing Pact bases too, which uh, are very much about defending civilians, but aggressing Elder Dragons as well. And Concordia is going to be one of the first of those bases we ever really come across. It's kind of a funny thing where if you as a player choose not to play the story, but you charge ahead really, really, really quickly, you can start coming across Pact bases and wonder, oh, what are these? But it's only if you play in the correct order, as I've done on this series here, you'll learn a lot of sort of exactly why they start sprouting up in the higher level zones. Um, so, yeah. Uh, that's pretty much most of the story stuff I wanted to talk about. I did want to start talking about some more engineering related things as well as we travel too. And just remind you of some skills. First of all, let's talk about Elixir U. This is the elixir that when we drank it, we get quickness speeding us up. And I used this with Professor Gore's machine before to uh, rip the hell out of all of the undead. Uh, elixir U used to have a thing where when you shattered it on the ground, it would create a wall. And I showed this off in the series, uh, a wall that would deflect or reflect projectiles. That has now been nerfed and changed completely. Not really nerfed, but the skill is just different now. Now it's like all about quickness on both. And getting a lot of those reflects and things requires different areas of the engineer profession. So I'm actually going to be turning Elixir U off here because while it's pretty good, and I probably will still run around a fair amount with it, uh, for some of the upcoming content, it won't be so necessary. I want to remind you of some other skills. Namely, looking back at our turrets, I want to remind you of the rocket turret. We didn't use this much. The rocket turret had this as its tool belt. The rocket launch, which has this huge arc, which will be very helpful in various situations, uh, that lands and we can fire away. And the rocket turret itself we place down, and it has the overcharge that does this. You see how all the mowers are knocked down? It, when you place it, it knocks down the mowers. It does really big damage, really high AoE damage but fires very infrequently. And if the rocket turret blows up, it's got a really long cooldown on it, okay? So that was the rocket turret. That's what rocket turret uh, offers us. And we've seen that before. Let me dismantle it here. Uh, but I kind of just wanted to refresh you all as we go forward. Let's grab this waypoint here. As we wade through this very long, unkept grass out in the Badlands, the southern areas of Blood Tide Coast here. Is the Sura. Our explorers are trapped by undead in the underwater caverns of Castaval. Can you spare a moment to help me out? Uh, I actually can't spare you a moment. Castable is kind of a scary place. There's a deep, dark, scary pit in the water out there. So we probably won't worry about that too much. What do you have to say? Uh, undersea caving is filled with rich sensation. So deep beneath any visible surface, you become weightless and unrooted. Wow, be careful down there. Yeah, it's, I guess that's kind of a cool idea that if you go into these weird, deep, dark, ca dank caves, it's almost like sen sensory deprivation chambers to an extent. Uh, that was one thing I wanted to remind you about with Engineer. The other was this. It was a mechanic I talked about a long time ago, uh, but is an important one. And that's the idea of utilizing our tool belt cooldowns without impacting our regular cooldowns. The idea of pre-casting. So, remember how we have the supply grate? We can summon a ton of turrets down. We've been using that a lot. Hopefully you remember it. Well, the tool belt version was this, the med pack drop. We can summon a ton of med packs onto an area. Now, I mentioned before, which when we're low health, we can pick these up and heal. Now, I mentioned before, though, you can drop the med packs and then swap the elite itself, the regular skill. You can turn it off your bar because the regular skill isn't on cooldown. And the med packs still exist despite the fact that we're now on the elite mortar kit and we get the orbital bombardments and stuff. So you can utilize this to do quite special things, such as the rocket turret. I can fire a rocket at that mower, and while it's in the air, swap the rocket turret off completely back to my elixir, and then get in combat, and I've got the elixir, and I can toss the elixir and all of that, right? So by pre-casting the rocket, we kind of got a free rockets of damage there 
just by flipping through things. And that's kind of... It's, it's weird to know where the devs are on that, but a big part of really fun engineer gameplay is playing around and knowing these kinds of things. Another example is, say, the, the flamethrower. That gives us incendiary arrow. We activate the incendiary arrow. Our next attacks will inflict burning. And now we can just turn the flamethrower off. We can go back to whatever was on here before, say, the flame turret instead. And now we can throw napalm down with incendiary ammo and drop a flame turret too. Okay? So that's an aspect of engineer. I just want to refresh you all uh, nice and piecemeal as we're on this adventure before overloading you with a ton of other information too. So, we're at a place called Mysterian Beach. Not much seems to be going on here, huh? Oh, what is this? We're sending you to shake hands with Tibble. <gasps> We're sending you to shake hands with Tibble. A risen commander just jumps us. So, okay, just across from the beach, and as we enter a place called the Whisper Will... I'm going to be really careful here. The Whisper Will Bogs. You will notice uh, if you are a certain part of the way through the story, if you have got to the point where Tybalt dies and you're a member of the Order of Whispers, a secret event can trigger. You can see it here, where Zaitan throws a risen commander at you. Sadly, it seems to be bugged and he's extremely weak. If you actually look in the top right here, the text describes a mechanic where he hides back in the Risen Horde and we shouldn't lose sight of him. Uh, none of that comes into play. Like I said, a lot of stuff's broken, sadly, in the core game and the devs won't go back and update. Uh, and he talks about Tibble. So you notice he's... You notice there that he's a Risen Char who said, damn your eyes. The game is never fully specific about this, but it seems... Uh, that they might be hinting that was Tibble. That was the corrupted risen Tibble. Now, let's think about the logistics of this. Claw Island is here. Tibble would have sacrificed himself here, maybe been thrown into the deep. The zombies we know are all full of the Sea of Sorrows. He could have floated down here. Uh, and so, yeah, you get that little pop-up, but that event will only pop up if you are at the right part of the story. Uh, I mentioned on yesterday's video, hey, I wonder if we'll find Fogel around or whatever. Well, here you go. This is a thing. Now, funnily enough, uh, there is an alternate version of this event as well where they spawn and they say this is for Fogel. And instead, it says to avenge Fogel. And there's another, which, again, I don't know if that turns into a Risen Norn there. Uh, and then finally, you'll, re you'll recall that the other mentor that can die is Siren. But Siren's a Silvari, and Silvari can't be corrupted by Zaitan. So does Siren get an event too? Well, she does. So I don't know, and I, I don't think the devs have ever confirmed. It's kind of up to you guys and your headcan to believe. Was that really the remains of our mentor? It's a very nondescript little thing that is easy to miss only if you travel in this direction at the right part of the story. Otherwise, you could just completely miss that. But it's one of the fantastic little details of the open world that is uh, truly quite beautiful, I think, actually. Um, so, yeah. There's a portal here where we could go even further south to territory as yet completely unexplored. I'm not going to go there. I'm a little bit scared of that place. That's very swampy and boggy and nasty and murky. We're not going that way. That is a potential route into where uh, Traherne wants us to meet, but we're not going to worry there. Instead, we're going to come up through here. This is actually a place we've seen before. Caraflower uh, enlisting the support of Karis and Tegwin occurred here. But now you'll notice things are looking a little bit differently. Do you remember earlier when we were on our, just at the start of this video and we saw all of these great jungle worm eggs? And the Asura were doing experiments, looking around. It looks like all of the players and the commanders have done something kind of crazy. They've triggered the meta event. And they have spawned the Amber Great Jungle Worm. This is known as Triple Trouble. And the meta says the three heads of a great jungle worm are attacking Blood Tide Coast. The actual specifics of how this is created shouldn't be happening in the timeline yet. But I'm really happy to show it off. This is some of my favorite content that the devs ever added to Guild Wars 2. True genuinely really challenging difficult stuff a hundred times harder than fighting the shatterer back when it released anyway uh so yeah i'm not gonna let that use up the whole video i'm just gonna stick away we're not even max level so we're not gonna be very helpful to them over there uh our adventure our job really is to get to concordia so yes with all of that said let's get a move on shall we cool you can even still hear it screaming all the way back here now this is a fine! Here we go! 
a place that is new for Brax, but nonetheless, hopefully you guys recognize a little. This is the Drake Cave with the sneaky entrance to Lornar's Pass and the mountains, of course. So that's uh, the Lost Wreck Waypoint. And we're going to be going on a swim straight away. Hold on, I just saw the entrance. Where was it? We're going to be going on the swim through. It's, it's this way. Jesus, I need to stay in the water. I'm happy we got the waypoint nonetheless, though. Oh, man. I, like I said, south of Lornars with the sound of these birds. Most beautiful area in all of the Guild Wars. I freaking... This is so tranquil. This is the ultimate chill-out zone. Seriously. You know what? I think we've got the time in this video for me not to super, super, super speed this. Get your headphones, listen and watch. Look how immersive this game can be. I'll let this play through and I'm not going to speak for a while. It won't take too long. Uh, but yeah, I think we've got time and I want to show this off. Here we go. This is Tyria Immersion. of discovery all right that's venison pass we're getting close almost there That, that is literally the most immersive and awesome, I think, adventuring in Guild Wars 2 can be. Oh, the sounds of the combat of the players nearby, the earth elementals, the, the rock dog lumbering along by our side, the deer. Oh, it's so good. Anyway, here we are, guys, to our destination, New Territory, the very south of Lornars Pass. Basically, there are two main routes south, one via the swamps and bayos, one via the mountains and uh really all routes towards ore at the very least uh are gonna take you through one of them uh we here are on the mountain pass for now it reminds me a lot of how guild wars one works too uh south of lornars into much more dangerous territory high in the climbs of timberline falls welcome timberline falls is a rugged upland dominated by two great river systems it is on the frontiers of Tyrian civilization and is the home of a lone freeholds, adventurer camps, and a myriad of races, including the Hylic, the Dredge, and Quaggan. Ah, <sighs> who can feel the frost on their face? Lovely. So, this is Krongar Pass, I think it is. Yeah, and we're at the Krongar Waypoint right now. We've got another player here standing around. Uh, this map is one of the most gorgeous maps in the game for me. I don't know what it is, but ArenaNet's methods of building mountain areas, they're just so good at it. I think the day-night cycle in particular is gorgeous here. And if you listen to the music... Oh, that should be some Guild Wars 1 nostalgia right there for you guys. It's the Shiver Peaks music that we heard all those years ago back when we were playing in the original game. Big Doliak pen here with lots uh, being cut out of, of, what is this, a passed out drunk Asura here hanging around. You would have thought that would be a Norn. There was even a bucket of water next to him. We could have splashed on his face to wake him up. And up here you can find, check it out, 
a lot of rowdy uh, Norn having a party, having a moot. We could partake in the moot. Rouse par uh, pass out partiers, sample beer and roasted meat on a stick. Send slackers back to their post. Check it out. Uh, these guys are dancing. You can get credit for this heart by feeding drinks to these people for stopping these skrit causing too much problems. Because look, the skrit are welcome to party with the Norn. They don't care. They're not a great when you get to see this side of them, just how inclusive they are when it comes to a party. Uh, yeah, you get these genuinely drunk script wandering around and you just want to make sure they don't ruin the festivities uh, with a little bit too much rowdiness. Uh, anyone want to talk to us specifically? What about you? This is a bad time to be trapped. I'm almost ready to admit defeat. Horgarth outdrank me again. Eh, well, have fun. Now, this is kind of a special place, I guess, a little, in that it would have been here we came uh, if we had chosen to recruit Fibhar to our cause um, um, among the pact and, and the orders, okay? So, uh, anyone who goes for Fibhar, they'll end up there at that place, and there will be an impromptu Norn tournament you deal with up there. It's actually a really cool instance that reminds me a lot of Guild Wars 1 Norn stuff, uh, where you get to see sort of how much they value fighting and strength of arms, despite this guy's ego. If we best him in battle, he will be on our side kind of thing. You know, that was a very Guild Wars 1-y thing, and this is one of the few places Guild Wars 2 taps into that really well, which is awesome. Uh, out here into these forests, <laughs> I was going to say the, these Timberline woods there for a second. Um, I guess uh, a player's been around here. These drakes are going a bit mental with us. We can take them out. Let's drop our turret. Don't forget that a flame turret overcharges dropping blinds for us, so we'll be nice and safe. Let's pick it back up. Yeah, it looks like a player's been here with a surveying banner. By grabbing this, it means as I gather woods, I do it more efficiently. And he's done it here because if you chop down the trees in forests like this, that because of the level of the zone, the wood is worth quite a lot. So you'll find people probably doing their gathering roots around here, and you can find traces of players out in the wilderness doing it. Which is also a really cool side of Guild Wars 2 that you don't often get to interact with. Uh, just for a moment here, I'm grabbing that waypoint, Gentle River, uh, because it's close to us, and we'll be wanting to go to that very soon. So not a big deal, I'm not quietly sorry. en route to where Traherne is. Now we're going to go a little bit more south. Hopefully the snow doesn't pick up. And, uh, in fact, next on our list, I think we're about to find an Asuran lab. Asura out here. Fancy that. So far away from home doing uh, worthwhile research, I would hope. It's just a matter of getting past these Jotun first. And I don't want to wage a massive war with them. How about we stick with the roads first, eh? Here's another waypoint. This is called Thistle Reed. You'll see some old broken Jotun stones here. And explore a Norn up there. And yeah, cresting the hill. Look at that. It's Nasura Lab. This is always one of the most idyllic looking ones to me. No, uh, they all just blend fine. into one another when you're on the tarnished coast. Just stack next to one another. But when you get like all these very natural formations everywhere. And then Asura Labs and just all their majesty sitting nestled against it. There's something really cool about it. Looks like there's problems though. Uh, there's an event going on. Collect the Etin test subjects for Jonga's experiment. Oh, that's slightly up to north. I guess they're doing experiments around in the area. We don't have to worry so much about that. Got lots of tech. I will stop off here just before we meet Traherne. Valence Tutory, it's called. Uh, to show you guys some cool little things that are going on here. One of the more interesting items in the game is available from this area. Uh, and it's for completing this heart. So what do you have to say? Uh, anything? I offer the best prices around. Oh, I was trying to speak to the wrong person. You, uh, Sessa. Greatest treasure. So much work to do with the lab and too many things slowing us down. How can I assist, fellow Asura? We have multiple projects in active development here, like gas guns, teleporters, and experimental staffs. Okay, tell me about teleportation devices. Tija's teleportation device is still in a prototype phase, but volunteer help with testing is always welcome. So basically, uh, here, if you do the heart, if you do the events in the air, I'm pretty sure it's the heart, you can get access permanently to a teleportation device. You, you buy them from the NPC and you can equip them. Uh, and as long as you buy enough oh, from the NPC, you can kind of just keep them in your inventory for a really long time. Uh, are you here to help with your quality assurance testing? Sure, why not? Okay, just get me some lodestones to test the teleport. Uh, will it not work with other lodestones? Ah, you need some. So we got to leave and bring lodestones back. But basically, it's a rifle, an experimental rifle gun that when you fire it, it creates mini portals. Uh, that players can travel between. One of the most useful weapons and items in the game for exploring in the early days, doing jumping puzzles and trying to break out of maps and stuff. So this is a lab a lot of people are familiar with because it's the only place in Tyria you can acquire it. Looking all the way up there, you can see nice little detail. There's some spider eggs up there. Culling those away would help with the heart as well. And then there's this little cave back here. 
with Asura Mining. We don't get to see enough Asura Mining, in my opinion. The Asura are subterranean, so every time I see this, I like it. They must be very familiar with digging tunnels and stuff. What's going on, guys? Uh, and what is this I see at the end of the Asura game? How may I assist you? With all this lab expansion, I hardly have time to work on my projects. It will be important. So they're expanding the lab and digging through it. It's nice to see that in progress, you know. Uh, here's a guy called Researcher Wick, who I thought was a reference, actually, to another character who I think is called Wiki. Uh, but he just says, no time to socialize. I have to calibrate this gate. Sorry to bother you. And interestingly enough, there's a panel here, which if we interact with it, it says there's a large button with a note above it that reads, do not push this button. We're going to push the button. You fool. I warned you not to push that button. What is it about buttons that half which find so irresistible? You're helping me deal with whatever comes through that gate. You hear? <laughs> and so you can trigger it dynamic event. We haven't done one of these for a while where you actually trigger it. Oh, God. Okay, so they've summoned golems to defend us. And here's a spark that's come running out. We'll drop our supply crate. As an engineer that can drop a lot of turrets, we should be fine to just destroy anything that comes through. And uh, Wick now has to recalibrate the gate while we defend him. No need, no time to socialize. I have to calibrate it. And I think the idea is that we... Um, uh, we maybe turned the gate on before it was ready. Uh, it's a funny idea as well to wonder where this goes. We never sort of get to come back in the story timeline years later when we realize how much they've expanded this lab and where the Asura gate they're planning to connect to. You'd think probably Ratasum. If you remember, there was a, a, a remote lab out in Brisbane Wildlands that had a lot of Asura gate technology and things going on. And based on the fact that the lab itself is experimenting with teleportation, who knows, maybe they're doing something really special. There was also that thing. Look, rabbits came out here. Just happy little rabbits. Will they attack me or just walk off? Oh, they just walk off. That's so cute. And what's sad is most players will be so spamming their abilities, they would never deal with those rabbits. Uh, those rabbits, sorry, would never survive is what I'm trying to say. Because they just blow them up straight away. Hopefully the event doesn't stall unless I kill them. I'm not required to kill them, am I? That would be very shame. But yeah, so you get etins. What, I guess it's an interesting dynamic event and it just uh, poses the question, what happens when an Asura gate is tampered with in the middle of creation, you know? Oh, here we go. Another one's coming out now. We can deal with more etins. So, uh, yeah, just a fun little thing out here en route. Uh, we're very close now to Concordia, so we'll get moving. There we go, Wick. I hope you're happy. I don't even think he wants to talk to us after that. Uh, there you go. He's pointing at the panel. Are you all, all good now? All right, fine. We will move on. I remember something as well. I knew I was forgetting something. Back when we were talking about how we look now. Um, obviously, I have the grenades in my hand right now. Coming back to our rifle, though. This is a new rifle we're wielding as well. I know it looks fairly Asuran. This rifle, though, uh, is actually a packed weapon. So I know I mentioned largely I'm only going to try and... Uh, wear the right gear for when it was actually added in the game. I think packed weapons came a little bit later in their acquisition. You wouldn't normally have it at this point, but it makes sense to me. We've just uh, started this new initiative, this idea of the pact, and by combining all the technologies of the orders and thus all the technologies of the races, you'll find the pact creates some ridiculous stuff, and we need some ridiculous stuff to be able to deal with the, the terrors ahead. Uh, so yeah, there is a full packed weapon set, and uh, as we progress through the game, you will hopefully see lots them here's the rifle uh and it's you know you can see it's an interesting blend of norn stylings uh asura technology char technology you know i, I don't think every single little bit of it can represent every race but they the the pack ends up having a very distinct like style about it uh, in its technology and what it does that is a combination of everything. A little bit like what we saw ages ago with Lion's Arch. All right, so here at the Jaya Rapids, just near one final waypoint, we can see the entrance to a story step that will take us to the new outpost that they have built just around the ridge. So let's get on in. Forging the Pact. This is one of the longest instances in all of Guild Wars 2. This story mission is a meaty one, and for very good reason. We're going to cover a lot of ground. Beautiful. Oh, the mountains. Don't they look good? There it is, just teasing us up ahead. And people are coming out to meet us. Here's someone called Historian Yowen. Hello, Historian Yowen. Oh, wait, hold on. Just before I speak to you, we got we got a mail. The game literally just gave us a mail. Here's the dove coming in now. Off it flies. Uh, what's this? Oh, it's Zodja. Hey, Zodja. Defeat is inconceivable. 
Sir Vance, I have to thank you. You just won me a hundred platinum from an old college friend. After I heard the Claw Island had been overrun, I bet them that you'd be the one to solve the problem and break all of the dragon's toys. It's the easy to be proud of you when I get to rub it in the Arcane Council's faces. Ha! Combining the orders was a stroke of genius. I don't know how you did it, but your efficient use of available resources deserves another reward. Speaking of awards, it's come to my attention that another of my master's apprentices has been causing trouble up near Sorrow's Embrace. Kudu never had two sparks to rub between his ears, and now he's claiming to have invented the biggest garlem in history? I'll believe it when I blow it up. Keep up the good work. Zodja. Ah, uh oh, hold on. Kudu, we remember Kudu, I hope, guys. Not an easy person to deal with. We got to interact with him a fair amount uh, because of the personal story steps we chose before. Uh, yes, Snaf had Zodja as an apprentice and also Kudu as an apprentice. He was that nasty inquest guy that did a big attack and just fled with his teleportation device before we could wring his neck. And he's up to more bad stuff. Zodja has been obsessed with Snaf. This doesn't seem too good. Trahan, everyone who's in there, can you wait just a minute longer? I think we should go check this out. Let's go back up to this waypoint. Gentle River. How convenient. Well, what do you know? Here's another mail. It's from our Herald. It says, Zodges in Sorrow's Embrace. Hail, mighty hero. I've heard from Kaith again. Oh, really? Wait, hold on. I thought we were talking about Zodja. Kaith is disappointed that she's been unable to reconcile Logan and Ritlock, but has reunited with Air. All right, so Kaith brought Logan and Ritlock to TA, got utterly abandoned. But the two girls, Kaith and Air, they've been pretty much fine. They've got no beef. They were all right with one another in Lion's Arch. They just had different ideas. Air's plan failed in Ascon Catacombs. Kaith's plan failed in Twilight Arbor. And now the two are heading into Sorrow's Embrace which used to be the Dwarven Foundries of Sorrow's Furnace. Those caverns are now occupied by the Dredge, who were once the slaves of the Dwarves. Reports have said that Zodja is already there, pursuing her own agenda. I don't know what she's after, only that she's going in with spells blazing. Kate would appreciate whatever aid you can give them, as always, your heralds. So, uh, as you can see from the timestamp up here, ages ago I actually got this mail. This was sent to Bract a long while back, but as I've explained, the game is really disorganized at the moment More in that it tries to get me. you to do some things at times where you really can't or shouldn't. So uh, yeah, they tell you about that dungeon way, way, way back. And it's only now in the story that it actually happens in the timeline and you get the other mail. It's just before you meet up with everybody at Concordia. So kind of a funny, unfortunate thing. But uh, yeah, Sorrow's uh, Embrace. Some interesting little trivia for you guys. That is the next dungeon. We'll be going there right now. It's not too far away if we just head deeper into the mountains and back up to... Uh, uh, oh my god, why am I forgetting the name? The um, Dredge Haunt Cliffs, that's it which is where we've seen a little bit of before. Uh, Sorrow's Embrace has a lot of interesting facts about. Um, it's uh, one of the original dungeons to ever be added to the franchise. And when I say franchise, I mean going back to Guild Wars 1. Uh, the original game had an update shortly after the main release, which added an open world map called the Grenth's Footprint and a dungeon within it called Sorrow's Furnace. And that was where we first got to play that. Uh, viewers of my original series that have gone through and know the full stories there. That's where we found all kinds of crazy stuff. In fact, it was from Sorrow's Furnace in Guild Wars 1. We first heard of an artifact called the Tome of the Rubicon. Now that you may remember, we some of the members of the Demon Priory have been interested in. And uh, we will get further payoff on later, I promised you guys, back when we we're looking at Priory stuff. Here's a scout while we're en route. Dredge and Grawl are becoming a problem to the east. The relentless drilling of the dredge is disturbing our prey. An aggressive Grawl have been pushing into the region. Help us deal with these nuisances so that we can get back to hunting. The Norn with just some completely petty seeming problems, it seems, right here. A beautiful area, nonetheless. Uh, sorry, dude, we're going to keep going north. So, yeah, it's like this big thing for the community. Sorrow's Furnace, one of the first dungeons, one of ArenaNet's first good stabs at the idea of endgame. And so, when Guild Wars 2 was being developed, 
one of the Guild Wars 2 dungeons is the same area. It used to be called Sorrow's Furnace. In Guild Wars 2, it's called Sorrow's Embrace. And yeah, it's uh, a dwarven mine that once upon a time was filled with dredge that were enslaved. And now, of course, we know that the dwarves are gone, that the dredge are not enslaved. And so the place I would expect 250 years later is uh, not very pleasant if you don't like dredge much. And the truth is, we probably don't like dredge too, too much. Uh, it's going to be just over here, these hills. You can already see a huge amount of dredge fortifications. This is a very southern area of dredge and cliffs that we hadn't been anywhere near just yet. Uh, Heimdall's last stand we're at right now. You'll find that the Norn run into all kind of petty skirmishes and troubles with them. And in fact, uh, over this hill, you'll see a lot of struggles from the Dermond Priory too down there with all kinds of crazy sieges. This is a place called Tribulation Rift, and if we jump into this chasm, it's not easy to get back out of this, by the way. If we jump into this chasm, we can make our first steps into the descent into the dungeon. Uh, yeah, so the Priory here. Explorer Kazka Grime Fur here. Says, are you an avid Spelunker? What? A lover of caves and all things cave-ish? Are you an avid fan of 11th century scaffold engineering? What? Are you an avid about everything? See this scaffolding? The intricate use of metal and timber? 250 years old and still load-bearing. The Stone Summit sure knew how to despoil the land. Is that a bad thing? Perhaps. But is art in the service of evil not still art? Ooh, that's a, I love that question. Uh, and we could just say, is that what the Dome and Priory believes? Because, of course, Bract isn't Priory. He has no interest in such things. The Priory doesn't just make judgments. We, we observe and catalogue. But the Dredge could learn a thing or two from proper excavation from this site. Tunnelling is about more than just pawing at the dirt. I'll let you get back to your Spelunkery. I like the idea that, yeah, the, uh, the Dredge find themselves with their freedom now. In these beautiful, majestic, really well-engineered caverns and structures that the Stone Summit and even um, other dwarves may have built but uh, they don't quite know how to do it themselves. So they're just sort of a little bit lost. Uh, yeah, this is a gorgeous area here. You can see that we're actually under the effects of another meta. In the pursuit of knowledge, the dredge have been pushed back to Tribulation Rift, which is all the way back there. Uh, this meta is all about dredge coming out and uh, trying to spread across the various territories here. There's another beautiful Guild Wars 1 style thing in the area too, which we'll definitely deal with in due time. But right down here, what, deep in the rift, we move past more Stone Summit stuff. With the orange flames, the lighting here is freaking gorgeous. And this is it. Sorrow's Embrace Waypoint, guys. Ah, oh, this, this is going to be full of nostalgia. Anyone who played the dungeon in the original game, ugh. Anyone who remembers what was in the deeps of the dungeon in the original game as well might know a little bit of what Kudu's talking about when he says he's invented the largest golem of all time. Ha. Huh. Here's a dredge that doesn't want to kill us. Karamaloth. Hello. Hello. Yes, you look healthy, strong, heroic, good teeth. Are you friends of the Norn and Silvari? They just went in ahead of you. Air and Kaith, they said the names were. Wait, what is this place? Long ago, this was a dwarven city, and the dredge were slaves. Now we are the masters. You can call this place Sorrow's Embrace. Not Sorrow's Furnace Embrace. Wait, K Air and Kaith are here? Why? They were hunting another one. An Asura with a bad temper. Zodja? Here? That sounds troubling. Let me ask something else. What exactly do you know? Sorrow's Embrace was once an industrious dredge land, but now others have infiltrated the Moltriat. Others! But I should say no more of them. Others? Alright, hold on, hold on, hold on. Kudu, we know, is affiliated with Inquest. Kudu goes here and start, makes a bold claims about some kind of golem. Uh, Zodja is uptight about Kudu for good reason, as we've seen. Zodja goes in after him. And then after Zodja's in, Aaron and Kaith, at a loss because they haven't managed to reunite Destiny's Edge, also come in. Okay, a lot's been happening while we were dealing with Claw Island, but I think I understand. What needs to be done? Gather a group of five total adventurers and descend into Sorrow's Embrace. You will find the women inside. All right, so the first women we're hoping to find are Kaith and Air, somewhere near the top, huh? Well, let's see what we got. Sorrow's Embrace is a great dredge city. Air and Kaith have gone within. Recommended players five? We don't need five. We just need Bract and some really smart engineering. I'll see you guys next time. So, yeah, there's a lot to talk about with NG. We will slowly get more kits, and we're going to be really reliant on those to get through these dungeons in the future. Let me mark my words. Well, look who finally caught up with the rest of the class. 
I heard you needed help to escape from my trap, Zoja. Big surprise there, right? You're too late, by the way. My Weathermatic 5000 is fully functional and ready to make it rain. Literally. That's my invention, Kudu. You're no genius. You're a derivative thief. And you dress like a ninny. Tell your tailor that other colors exist. <laughs> oh, Snaff's sidekick brought a sidekick of her own. A uh, side sidekick. Yes, I stole your design and improved it a thousandfold.